So welcome, Olori Koitus, to uh, A Slice of Health, Now Taboo Doctor. Thank you so much for coming on today's episode. Uh, thank you so, so much for joining us. And um, well, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, obviously. Um, but what I'd like to do is ask you to introduce yourself. Tell us a lot about yourself. Um, and we'll ask you a few, we'll ask you a few icebreaker questions before we jump into our topic, which is demystifying sexuality for the African woman. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mo. Thanks for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So tell us a lot about yourself. <laughs> I love that. Usually people say, tell us a little about yourself, but you're like, tell us a lot. Yes. Um, my name is Yesterday. I am a sexual health educator. I am the founder of Olori Coitus. Olori Coitus is a sexual health and intimacy platform um, for, I guess, the millennials. I, I, I tend to shy away from the word millennials, but millennials are people from the 20 to 40 age bracket, which are really those are my biggest audience. And what I do on Olorikoitus is literally just the sex ed that you wish you had in school. Um, so we talk everything from sexual health, sexual pleasure, sexuality, um, you know, intimacy, helping you like grow a better connection with yourself, and then translating that into a better connection with your partner. Um, what else do I do? I, I am also the head bida at Ilekedi. Ilekedi is a waist bead and body adornment um, fashion company in Lagos. I make waist beads, exclusive, exclusive and exquisite waist beads for the modern woman, wherever she is. We ship within Nigeria and also outside of Nigeria. I've always had a love for jewelry, as you can see, all of my hands. Uh, I love jewelry and I've always loved waist beads. And I just kind of put the two together into making pieces that would, you know, appeal to the more co cosmopolitan, metropolitan woman. Um, I, in my day job, I work in a community um, organization which um, deals with um, HIV, the HIV response. Um, so I, I, I literally work in health, like in all aspects of my life, I guess. I am also really passionate about some um, social impact causes. So I work with some organizations that deal with um, hunger, you know, um, mm. education for children, for low income children, and also like um, delivering healthcare services to um, people in the low income spectrum. Uh, what else do I do? I like to read. I love podcasts. Gosh, I love podcast I listen to a lot of podcasts which is why I'm starting my own Ooh, wow, yeah. Yeah. that's fantastic <laughs> yes. thank you um it's been it's been a long time coming and I'm really looking forward to launching it before the end of the year wow. uh thank you uh what else I have a husband and a three-year-old who keeps me on my toes and uh yes I just love to hang out I love going to the beach gosh one of the perks of living in Lagos is uh, proximity to water I think I have a water spirit. Um, I, I love I love water. I, I, I literally like I went to school in Florida and I've always I, I've always wanted to be close to water. I don't know. Mm. Whenever I go to the beach, the beach is my happy place. I always um, I go there. I can go there to watch the sunrise. I can go there to watch the sunset. I haven't done that in a while now and I really should do more. Um, but I used to do that a lot and it just, you know, centers me, keeps me at peace, gives me, you know, I can think and just, you know, work better. So yeah, I love going to the beach. And I think I've told you a lot. That's great. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay. And so how did you then come to this point of, so you mentioned that you went to school in, in Florida, but how did you, how did Olor Coitus come about? What birthed it? Uh, although because this is a long time coming, um, I did study, I did um, study health education and human behavior in, um, in college. And then I went on to do my master's in public health with a focus on um, human, on health policy and also human sexuality. Um, I have always worked in the, how do I put this? I worked in the sexual health space both formally and informally since 2004. So now this is, gosh, I'm showing my age, 16 years. Um, <laughs> uh, so when I was in college, I used to volunteer with a group called Gato Well. We used to um, distribute condoms around campus. I, I've always had an interest from a young age. I was the girl who knew a lot about sex from reading. I was an average I am still an avid reader. I read Every Woman when I was nine and it really opened my eyes. I took it from my mom's library and I read it. 
and it really opened my eyes because every woman i think it's a fantastic book it really does um show you um, about sex and um the woman and sexuality in a very matter of fact no holds barred way that is not vulgar like i was reading it and i didn't feel like i was being um I wasn't feeling violated. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, and I think that's what Ulrich Koitos does. Like I talk to you about sex in a very, in a way that like, we'll talk about it like over lunch. We'll talk about it in a way that, you know, I don't I don't think you can, you necessarily have to be afraid. There's some sexual health pages or some sex education pages on Instagram where, you know, you don't want to open them in public because you don't know what you're going to find. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that you can definitely listen to what I say and the things I share in a public space and not feel violated. Obviously, this is not content for um, a 12 year old or a 10 year old, but it's definitely content that like is can be, you know, can be shared um, publicly. So Olori Koitas started as Orisha Koitas in the early days of Instagram, where I wanted to do um, a forum. I wanted to start a page where people could ask questions about sex and sexual health anonymously and get answers from an anonymous, say like uh, an agony aunt. Um, I think Colombia had, um, and I think they still have this um, platform, which is called Go Alice. And it's very similar. You know, you send your questions in anonymously and you get answers anonymously. Um, I started and stopped, started and stopped a lot of life events. And I didn't really put a lot of effort into it, honestly. But then in 2017, I decided to, you know, start it all over again. And this time it was rebranded into Olori. Koitos. So Orisha is the Yoruba word for goddess or go god and goddess. Mm -hmm. And then I say, you know, I'm the goddess of sex. Um, yeah. <laughs> because I had I have this um I had this fascination with um Yoruba mythology mm -hmm. and you know the gods and the goddesses. And I think that it's really great for us to be able to connect to that because we a lot of it has been really demonized and they're not. We talk a lot about Thor and we talk about all the Greek gods, and nobody says, oh, they're devilish and they're demonic. But when we talk about our own, you know, historical cultural gods because of colonization, who, you know, our colonial masters came and told us that these things are bad and these things are demonic, only worship Jesus and only worship Allah. And um, I'm not saying that you should go and start worshiping Oya and Ugo and um, Oshun, but I'm saying that understand that these are our cultural heroes. Understand that, you know, like we watch Marvel comics and we think that they're fantastic, but then nobody's going to do, why have there not been movies about Oya and Oshun and Shongo? Like, I mean, I think there've been a few movies on Shongo, but you know, like, let's talk more about these. These are, these are our foremothers and our forefathers and our cultural heroes. Anyway, sorry to segue, but That's that right. was how Olori Orisha Koitos started. Mm -hmm. um, then it became Olori Koitos. Um, and Olori Koitos then started in 2017, was registered as a company. So yes, I, we are CAC registered as a company. Yes, thank you Yay. very much get those coins. Uh, so now not only do I, you know, teach sexual health on, say on social media, I also do sex coaching. I got my life coaching certification. And so I work with couples and individuals to improve not only their sexual health, but improve their sexual connections with themselves and with each other. Um, not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to come to me when you have a problem. I do things like I have bridal showers, I have um, I have uh, women's groups and groups call me to come and sit and speak to them. And I also have couples who, literally, I was just on a call, you know, I, I was telling you earlier that I was on a call with a couple. I have couple um, couples come to me because they're like, oh, look, uh, sex life is okay. I think we're kind of like a 50. We would like to get it to maybe like an 80. What can we do? And, you know, we just sit down and just have like some, you know, we talk about practical ways to be able to get there. It doesn't necessarily always mean that, you know, I come from a coaching is more of goal based. You have something you want to do. What are the tools you have and what tools can we equip you with to get there as opposed to therapy where like you're kind of going back to kind of see like okay what in your past has affected how you are and all that which is also good but while therapy is kind of like looking back coaching looks forward so i'm a sex coach so uh so Ulrich Curtis deals with those two aspects and um yeah it's been really great um the reception i remember when i when like Ulrich Curtis relaunched people used to be afraid of following me on instagram um yes i knew they were saving my post and i knew they were seeing it because some people would say oh i saw you all this or oh my husband forwarded this to me or my wife sent me this or my girlfriend told me to go watch it but oh i saw your video but they wouldn't follow and they wouldn't like because Public. you know back in the day when instagram used to show you i think when you go to the um explore page or something you could see like oh yes yeah. like 
this picture yes. and yes they follow this person and people were just really really like anxious about other people knowing that they were there and sometimes even if someone comments on my page then their friend will see them and say ah, what are you doing here they, they'll say ah, ah you too what are you doing here you know like that it was just really interesting back then and i remember when i started i used to get a bit um discouraged because i felt like why you know like so I am putting my face to this because, again, Olori Koitos became Olori Koitos from Orisha Koitos because mm -hmm. I realized that putting a face to it would humanize the message and make it more relatable. So I felt like, okay, so now I have lifted the veil. I am now putting my face here. And yet you guys, you people are not really, you're still afraid to come out. But, you know, I persisted. And I'll tell you now, I think Olori Koitos has almost 15,000 followers on Instagram now, um, people like, comment, they share, they post to their stories, they tell their friends, you know, people say, oh, you know, like, I, just, I follow you, I just, you know, so now there's, um, and I think also um, social media has helped, the more yeah. comfortable we are being in like the social media space and sharing, the more people see that you're sharing very authentic stories yeah. and um, authentic messages about things like human sexuality, the more comfortable they are in publicly engaging with it as opposed to doing it like hush hush in the dark like oh just on my phone nobody can see it they are now you know people can now say with their chest that they follow me or say with their chest that they've learned things from not just me but other because there are a lot of really great um sex educators out there even in the nigerian space and i think it's really great that people are able to engage in a public manner yeah yeah, yeah. so for those that yes we talk about sex a lot but what is sex wow <laughs> what is sex? I, I promise, I don't think anyone has ever asked me what is sex. I'm glad I'm um, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I like to, so I'd like to say that sex is um, a physical expression of intimacy. So it's, it's a lot of times people use the word intimacy and sex interchangeably, but um, intimacy is definitely like more varied and more mm. nuanced than just sex. Sex is a coming together. Um, if you look at it from a historical standpoint, sex was um, penetration. So penis going into vagina or penis. In fact, a lot of people did not consider anal sex as mm. sex because the penis was going into um, an anus as opposed to a vagina. But now we know that sex is a combination of everything that has to do with physical intimacy. Mm. So even from kissing to oral sex to, you know, touching, um, using your hands on each other, not just on your genital areas, but if, literally anything that encompasses physical intimacy between two lovers is sex. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is, I, I think that is a fantastic um, description because it then makes it quite open in terms of what you're then defining as sex as well. So the topic for today is demystifying pleasure, sexual pleasure for the African woman. Do you think that the average African woman or the average millennial African woman understands her own sexual pleasure? Well, I think that, well, I don't want to say no. So I, I want to say yes and I want to say no. Okay. I want to say, I say no because we did not grow up being told that pleasure was the thing that we could have mm. we, um, we didn't even it didn't even like what is pleasure like <laughs> it, it just you know it, do, it doesn't even it's not in the it's not in the dictionary for us um so for a lot of us we're discovering it as adults which is why i don't want to say no all the way because there's a lot that we're learning and relearning and unlearning yeah. and um, pleasure is one of the things that we are learning so the average african woman at least the average should I say, um, I don't say cosmopolitan, but you know, if you have more women who have um, access to say the internet, are starting to understand pleasure a bit. However, I see that a lot of the women that are understanding pleasure are still not really understanding it in context of themselves. Mm. It's more about still very, very patriarchal and about pleasure for him. You know, there are a lot of products and services that are being offered in terms of, oh, make yourself sweet for him or how to blow his mind. And even if you think about it, even in the Western context, you know, um, magazines like Cosmo and um, I'm calling Cosmo out, but that's the only one I can think of now. But there are a lot of women magazines that would, you know, whenever they talk about intimacy or sex, they would talk about like, oh, positions to blow his mind, how yeah. to make yourself, you know, like not 
well, they're not talking a lot about you know what you can do for yourself. How about positions <laughs> to blow your mind, positions to give you pleasure? Or oh, here are some things you can do to tap into yourself. And you know, just learning the experience of that pleasure is not always just sexual, is whatever makes you feel good. Mm. So yeah. And so how do you how does someone then get to that point where their sexual experience is not just about the patriarchal way that we've been taught, not just about their male partner, but also about them? How do we get someone to understand that actually your sexual pleasure is also important? I think it starts with the understanding that like you're worthy. Mm-hmm. So I think self-esteem is like a really big part of it and understanding about self-esteem and self-love. Um like I said, it's not really something that women, especially in this part of the world are empowered with Mm. growing up and just with, you know, all the messages that you're bombarded with in society, you know, nobody really tells you that like you are worth it or that you are worthy of pleasure. So you're raised, especially as a woman, they'll say, you know, the woman is the, is the backbone of the household. You're the one that holds everything together. So all you know is do, 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 and do for others. And it makes you, and you give, you're giving, but you also have to learn that a big part, part of self-love is being able to receive. So even I used to teach a workshop called Own Your Pleasure, which mm-hmm. should be coming back very soon. And it was just about women understanding and owning pleasure for themselves. Sexual pleasure is a part of it, but even just understanding pleasure, like what do you enjoy doing? What are the things that make you happy? Not for somebody else not for outside validation but what are the things it could just be like the feel of like a silk shirt on your body you know it could just be like oh i just love to sit down and curl up and read a book or play a game or you know like whatever it is and i think that that's just the beginning when women can take more time to do that without guilt because guilt and shame is a big part of it learning to accept pleasure without guilt is a big um, way in now learning to accept sexual pleasure and then accepting and then seeking, actively seeking for pleasure for themselves. Mm, I love that. And I really love how you talked about self-care as well in terms of just taking time to do the things that you enjoy and just, you know, just for yourself, regardless of, you know, sexual, whether it's sexual or with the partner as well. And you said something about, you know, understanding your own pleasure and your own body. And I think there's been quite a big move going back to Cosmo and things like that about a woman understanding what pleases her herself before she then goes on with a partner to then be able to say, okay, no, this is what I like and this is what I don't like. But in our culture, there is a bit of a stigma attached to that kind of talk because that also involves masturbation. As a sex coach, what do you say to that and how can you best educate us in terms of which way a woman should should go with that? So I'll tell you what the research says. The research says that um, women who masturbate are more likely to have a better understanding of their bodies Uh, how their bodies work, how their bodies um, accept and receive pleasure, and they are more likely to have more orgasms. I didn't make that up. That's what the research says. And so I encourage women to discover their bodies any way you can. Now, not everybody is comfortable with masturbation, maybe from a cultural or from a religious standpoint. And I think it's always good for you to sit down and discover and kind of do a lot of self-introspection because two tenets of um, a healthy sexuality is self-introspection and then communication. Mm -hmm. So you do self-introspection and understand that these values that you're holding, are they your values or were they values that were thrust upon you? Hmm. Then when you have decided that, okay, these are my values, then you can decide whether you want to do it or not. If your values are that masturbation is not right for you, then don't. If your values are that, okay, you know what, maybe I could try this thing, or maybe it's not so bad. And then again, you know, it just depends on the context in which it is. For some people, even though they're religious, they, if they see masturbation as, you know, learning about themselves so they can now communicate it with their partner. So I'm learning how my body works because I cannot say, Mo, come to my house in Lagos. And you say, well, how do I get there? You say, don't worry, you'll find it. Ah, you know, you know Lagos, now when you get to Lagos, ah, you should know how to get to Lagos, hmm. and, but Lagos is a big city. So a lot of women are coming up with the ideas that these men should know exactly how they, the woman's pleasure is. They should know exactly how to satisfy her sexually. And they don't tell him, they don't give him a roadmap. 
They don't tell him, oh, I actually like my scalp being stroked. Oh, I actually like it when you kiss my neck. They just assume. And then you hear things like, oh, he didn't give me an orgasm. See, is he a mind reader? How should he know? You know, so if you look for me, if you look at masturbation, maybe the word masturbation itself, it's the connotation of the word. So I like to talk about, you know, like self-exploration, you know, self-pleasure and, you know, discovery. Look at it from the lens of curiosity and discovery. What do I like? In fact, if you feel some type of way about it, do it in front of your partner. You know, let him even help you. You know, there's mutual masturbation where you are, you know, doing it. He's masturbating you. So that you can now do it because look there's a huge orgasm gap right and we know that 75 percent of women that if four of us were sitting here three of us would not have an orgasm with penetration alone mm. now we know that orgasm is not the only it's not like the goal of sex because we're not having goal oriented sex but if you are not having an orgasm ever that's a problem mm. so think about it as trying to close your orgasm gap give yourself more pleasure and then communicating it with your partner Mm. yeah that is that is really interesting and i really like the analogy that you used about someone coming to your house let's say coming into lagos we had an episode recently and we were talking about um delayed and um, premature ejaculation in men and the fact that a lot of masturbation can also cause a lot of premature ejaculation in men as well and so then also causing a uh, problem with their sexual partners when they then come come back together what kind of issues can that self discovery as a woman on her own then cause if you know she's done she's explored herself can that then cause issues in her own relationship with her partner i think with all things right moderation is the key mm. so whenever we talk about issues with men and masturbation we're talking about men who masturbate on an almost an addictive level you know, I mean, anything is bad. Even water can be bad if you drink too much of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So masturbation is not that you're going to be canceling work because you're masturbating, refusing to go out with your friends because you're masturbating, spending time with other people because, oh, I'd rather just stay in my room and wank. Mm -hmm. Then we have a problem. Anything can be addictive. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that masturbation is not addictive or doesn't have the potential to be, but I think everything has the potential to be even fitness people who work out some people get addicted to working out and instead of working out for like an hour an hour and a half in the gym they're there for five hours yeah. that is a problem even though working out is a good thing yeah. so with women it can if you start to feel that you would rather masturbate than be with your partner then you want to examine one your reasons for masturbating and then number two you want to examine your relationship and your sexual relationship with your partner because it means that you're not getting fulfillment in that relationship and you're not getting fulfillment in your intimate time together yeah so what can you do to change that as opposed to just taking master and just be like oh, okay i'm not getting i'm not really getting satisfaction but instead of me trying to change that i'm going to take a cop out and just masturbate afterwards you know, there are women who they literally would have sex. And sometimes it's the man, the man will have sex with them. He will ejaculate and he's done and he falls asleep. Not caring about her pleasure. And she herself does not say, hey, guy, please wake up. We're not done. She's just going to keep quiet. He's going to sleep. Then she pulls out her vibrator or starts to masturbate herself until she orgasms. And then she feels, okay, I'm done. But really, what's that? That's not the point of sex. Sex is not just physical, right? So if you're having that and you're not being satisfied, you need to then be like, hey, there is an issue here. Let us work it out in our relationship and work out how we are going to make that better. And you'll find that, I mean, honestly, sometimes, yes, you just want to masturbate because you don't want to worry about like communication and all those other things, but it shouldn't be that you want to masturbate more than you want to have that sexual intimacy with your partner. So when you start to see that there's a red flag and you really have to watch it, you may have to stop and stop masturbating for a while. But I find that even stopping to masturbate for a while is not really going to solve your problem because if you don't address the issues and the underlying issues in your relationship, you're not going to be able to fix whatever is wrong and you just be mm -hmm. stuck with the problem. Yeah, definitely. And obviously that is then addressing the root cause of communication basically and there then being a communication gap in your relationship so what ways would you or what skills would you then be able to give women to say actually i know it might be difficult for you to address this and try to talk about this but how how can we then go about talking about the sexual state of a relationship to then be able to reach that point of 
fantastic physical intimacy? So I always think that the first thing is that you don't have to bring up the sexual state of your relationship in the middle of sex or just when you're about to have sex. Always find a neutral time, a time when you're both um, just, you know, where emotions are not high and there's no pressure of, um, you know, performance anxiety. Mm. So I'm saying maybe you're sitting down on the couch watching TV, you're out on a date, or maybe it could be through text. Some some people are not able to verbally assert themselves. Mm. So send a text. I mean, everybody chats these days. You're probably sending lots of texts and memes all through the day. So just send, you know, you can just start a segue. And I always like to say that, you know, do like a sandwich method. I learned this, um, I remember doing life coaching, which is you say something good, you stick the, the harder parts, the harder truths in the middle, and you say something nice to buttress it. And so at the end of the day, you're still communicating what you want, but you know, yeah, it's something like this. Um, babe, I really love how, you know, we're always so good together. Like, I love how you just love me. You're always so sweet to me, blah, 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 blah. And then you then go, maybe your problem is that he doesn't, he's not waiting enough before penetration. But I always feel a bit rushed whenever we're together, as much as I love us, you know, being intimate and I love having sex with you. I sometimes feel like, you know, like we rush a lot to penetration i really love it like when you're kissing my breast and you're stroking my clit and i would like for i would like for us to do a lot more of that you know so you know i because i think you're a fantastic lover but i really would like to see more of your fantastic loving in the areas of xyz what have i done i've told him great job in the middle i told him look guy you're rushing me stop it yeah right but at the end i'm like you're a fantastic lover i want to see more of that what he's going to take away is that he's a fantastic lover I love when he does X, Y, Z to me, but I'm not doing enough. So let me up my game. He's more likely to want to do that yeah. as opposed to, look, I'm just not getting enough goals. You know, like, what, what are you doing? Like, this is not working out. Yeah. Like, you know, so it's literally all about approach. And I know I've heard women, especially on Twitter, they're like, no, no, no. Why are you trying to, why are you trying to like, you know, couch his feelings? Why are you trying to make him feel good? You know, um, like, oh, men are trash. If men are trash, why are you with him? Good. Yes, good. that's a good question. Don't get me wrong. Some yeah. men are trash, but not all men are trash. Mm. And so can we can we do things? I believe in doing things with kindness, yeah. right? And being kind even to not just people we're in relationships with, being kind to ourselves and being kind. If you can be kind to your friend, like you're not going to talk to your friend anyhow, right? There's some things your friend would do and you'd be like, oh, okay, how am I going to tell her this? Yeah. It's the same thing right and yes you're keeping their feelings involved it doesn't mean that you are now so conscious of their feelings that you now don't say anything mm. that's not okay but it's just about you know it's just approach approach is everything so find a way that is very comfortable for you where you are not so uncomfortable and tr the truth of the matter is some things are uncomfortable to say but not everything in life we're adults not everything in life is supposed to be easy so you have to find ways to get the hard truths out Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. And just going back to the masturbation point, I think there's been a lot of conflict in, in talking about that as well because of the use of porn and the use of erotica alongside of that, which also have, which we now know actually that, you know, there's a lot of addiction, especially with porn, porn use. What do you say about using those things to augment that, that part of sexual pleasure? Okay, again, I go back to what the research says, and then I will also give you my, um, my personal opinions. Okay. So the research has shown that sex is very performative. I mean, porn is very performative yeah. and it's um, very patriarchal. And so it shows a very patriarchal sense of how sex is. It's from a male gaze. The producers yeah. are men, the um, directors are men, um, a lot of people that are working in the sex industry, I mean, in the positions of power in the, you know, in the porn industry are men. And so what this means, the writers are male. So what this means is that you're seeing sex from a man's perspective. So with, especially with mainstream sex, what are you saying? There's not enough foreplay. I don't even like the word foreplay. I like to say sex play. So mm -hmm. literally you see the woman, next thing her clothes are off. He touches her nipples for like a second, kisses her. Next thing he's penetrating. What, and a lot of people watch porn for education. They take a lot of instruction. Porn is not instructional. It is supposed to be, you know, just entertainment. But a lot of people take porn as instructional. And so there's a 
big, big um, problem when people start to watch things like that and they think that this is how it should be. Mm. Especially with a lot of men, they think that this is how it should be. So sometimes men are saying, oh, I have men that uh, come to me for sessions that say, oh, my wife doesn't squirt. You know, I've been trying to get her to squirt, but she doesn't squirt. She has a problem. I know that he's been watching a lot of porn because in the porn, the, the, woman has, the woman has squirted and it's like literally like they turn on a tap like, Tss. you and I know that most women that are, even if they squirt, may not necessarily squirt that way, not with that intensity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when women squirt, it's literally just extra lubrication in the vagina and mm -hmm. it's not obvious. So a man starts to get these expectations, you know, they start to think it's okay to give women a golden shower. They start to think that it's okay to not ask for consent. So you just go ahead, you know, you think, oh, you know, you don't really, and the woman is there screaming and uh, 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 and then he's teaching women that they need to fake their orgasms because when a woman has an orgasm and she's not screaming, the man is like, oh, didn't you orgasm? She's like, yes, I did. But he's like, why didn't you shout? And she's like, I don't know. So next time she wants to shout so that he can feel like, oh, he's done this. So mm -hmm. sex, so sex in porn, in pornography, porn, it's very performative. And personally, on a personal level, I don't recommend it because I feel like it puts a lot of images in our heads and it gives us all these expectations that are very unrealistic and we take those into our relationships mm -hmm. instead of that i always i tell women that i teach i say you know what create your own porn in your head like when you're watching it you're watching someone else's idea of their own fantasy so create your own fantasy in your head mm -hmm. where would you like to be what will you be doing what is he doing to you how are you enjoying it you know literally you're you can create better porn in your head than what anybody can make on TV. So create your own porn. Mm -hmm. That is that is really interesting. And what what would you then say to women who find themselves in that relationship where their partner is so used to porn and that is where they're getting a lot of their education from, but she is making her own stuff up in her head, but then they then have this clash of understanding and you know he's expecting things from her that she's not able to give because she's not an actress. Um, and he's, and you know, she's expecting things from him that he's not informed about and is not willing to do because he hasn't seen that on porn. I would, I would say definitely you need to um, have a coaching session with the sex coach or sex therapist. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily because, I mean, there's definitely an issue here. Mm -hmm. There's an issue with communication and there's an issue with expectations. Sometimes, the, between the two of you, because emotions are high, and this is a very subjective issue, you may not be able to sit down and iron it out by yourselves. So you come to a sex coach who is an objective um, third person who can see both sides and kind of help you both like wade through all the emotional stuff. So kind of like cut through the emotional bush and get to the heart of the matter for the two of you so that the two of you can then communicate with each other and get the results that you're looking for because it's not the end of the world. And I mean, obviously, if she's telling him, oh, it's porn, look, you're thinking about porn, I'm not a porn, I'm not a porn star, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's coming from a lot of emotional, you know, there's a lot of emotion laden into it. So him maybe hearing it from a third party and kind of just understanding how this is affecting his relationship with her can help him. And then her learning how to communicate what her desires and her fantasies are to him in a way that he doesn't feel um, attacked about mm. his current sexual performance and in a way that he doesn't feel that he's not good enough. Yeah. It's also, which, which also is the same way for him as well because the porn he's thinking about, those are his expectations. So I'm not saying that you should get rid of your expectations, but you need to make your expectations more realistic. So he has to find a way to make his expectations more realistic and also communicate that in a way that she doesn't feel threatened about his sexual needs. Yeah, yeah definitely. And in terms of communication as women as well, in terms of talking about things, because I always feel as though there's always a woman in a group who is more willing to talk about these things, but especially in our societal context, everyone looks at her as a pariah. And why why do you know all that stuff? Why are you so informed? What have you been doing? And, and there is a potential that she's not been doing anything. She just actually knows a lot because she has put herself in through study and she probably has delayed things more but then everybody else has perhaps explored. What, what would you say about talking about these things amongst ourselves so that we can demystify it and remove the stigma attached to it? 
So the person you just spoke about was me, and it's still me in my group of friends. Um, in in I have a, a couple of group of friends, but in my say my group of friends from secondary school, they think yesterday is spoiled. I mean, they've been saying it since secondary school, and then when I went to university, I remember one of my friends. Um, most of them went to England for university, and you know my friends from England would say, "Ah, I'm never sending my child to America." Ah, they, they get so spoiled. <laughs> Ah, look at yesterday, like she knows all these things. She says all these things. Meanwhile, yesterday she was saying them. She knows these things. She's not necessarily acting out, acting them out, but she mm -hmm. can tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Um, so it's all, we have to learn to take away, you see, that whole purity culture and that whole idea that women should not, women should not be engaged in conversations around sex and conversations around pleasure and conversations that have to do with anything bad, like all the bad, like any woman that talks about this is a bad girl, mm -hmm. is um, things we need to leave in 2020. You know, <laughs> 2020 has been an interesting year. And I think there are a lot of things we can leave and that is one of the things we can leave there. Um, a woman who is, and even look, even if a woman is saying all these things and she is involved in, sexual activity how is that your business mm. like why is that your problem you know like we we always want to you know remove the log in other people's eyes and not remove the speck in our eyes like mind your business you know but it's this whole judgment culture and cancel culture that we've been carrying since we were young always looking to bring down others so we can feel better about ourselves you know it's always that oh Ha, ah, she's a bad girl. Mm -hmm. So that makes you feel like, oh, I'm a good girl. And that is, you know, we don't necessarily need to bring down others to make ourselves feel good. We don't. Yeah. We can definitely um, uplift, even if someone is doing something that you are not um, party to or you don't necessarily agree with. I don't think that you necessarily have to bring them down or shame them for you to feel better about yourselves. You can, you know, that, that term that says we rise by lifting others. I believe that. I fully believe that. Yeah. And it's really great that you just talked about purity culture because I, I asked um, a few people on social media to send in some questions. And one of the questions I got was um, a young lady in Nigeria who's in a dating relationship and they are pursuing chastity in terms of, you know, a religious dating situation. But she's using um, sex toys at home. Um, and so she was feeling really guilty about it and saying, oh, you know, that he, he's not, you know, forcing me into into doing anything and he's respected that I want to be celibate but I'm not really being celibate because I'm doing this and it's this sort of guilt thing what would you say to somebody in that situation I think she should she should really sit down and explore her reasons for being celibate mm. because right now we know that she's not celibate what she is is she's celibate you know, that idea of as long as a penis is not penetrating me, I am still chaste. However, like you asked me at the beginning that what is sex and um, what she's doing is sex. So I believe that if you're going to be chaste, I mean, if you're going to be chaste or if you're going to be celibate, I think that you have to determine why. I think the reason why people would say that they are celibate or they are virgins and all this and then engage in other types of sexual activity is because they have not realized the real reason why they're doing it a lot of times their motivations for doing such things are external like mm -hmm. validation from society from their peers um you know feeling that okay god is going to love me more if i do this feeling that okay if i keep uh, myself a virgin or I keep chaste, my husband, my reward is a, you know, a great husband who's going to value me above all other women because he met me as a virgin. But sis, are you a virgin? Because then we start to ask questions about, I mean, of course, you know, the concept of virginity is a patriarchal construct mm -hmm. and it really, there's no biological definition of virginity. Um, but if you look at it from a cultural standpoint, some people um, in the purity culture would then say, I've heard women and I've seen actually when I worked at the health department, girls will come in, they have been like their anuses are torn. They are virgins because they have not had any penetration in their vagina, but they're allowing anal sex occur on them. You know, they're having oral sex, they're doing everything, but they're going to allow, they literally will tell you, I allow everything but inside my vagina. What is that? You know, like you're not doing it for yourself. You're not doing it because of internal motivating factors. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great for you to be able to say, for women to, you know, be celibate or choose chastity. But you have to really 
be doing it for the right reasons and you have to be doing it for reasons for yourself because what happens is when your reasons are externally motivated it's very easy for you to slip up mm. it's very easy for you to you know for you to get a relationship and say oh okay so we're just going to do it just up to here like tell me first of all what is your own idea of chastity because what she's feeling about guilt and shame is she's she's not she's wishy-washy right it's like oh, I have these sexual desires and sexual urges. I have said I'm not going to you know, have sex, so let me find other ways to do it. Now, it is up to you to determine if your masturbation is considered chaste or not. It's a personal decision. It's between you and God, depending on whether you're choosing to be chaste for God or you're choosing to be chaste for cultural reasons. But you really have to be able to sit down and determine why you do what you do because nobody can you now be coming to people like me like i have people in my dm saying oh yeah i am um, in fact i don't even answer dms like that anymore because now i tell everyone to send me emails instead yeah. because i find that my D, like i spend more time like trying to respond to people by dm as opposed to like when you send me emails i can take my time to respond mm -hmm. um so people send me you know emails i promise you i got an email this week that was asking about oh you know i am a virgin and uh, my boyfriend and i we do it you know like he he has me give him oral sex and then he ejaculates on me is that am i still a virgin if i'm allowing that to happen you know and i had to be like hey what is your definition of virginity and what is your reason for doing this because for me, you're having sex, right? You're having oral sex. He is, you know, putting his hands inside of your genitals. He's rubbing, kissing. you're doing everything, but penetrating of, cause he's penetrating you with his hands. He's not penetrating with his penis. What is your definition of it? And why are you doing it? Because if your reason for doing it, if you think that, oh, I'm going to be more precious or my value, my worth is going to be more because I am a virgin. I was a virgin before I got married then you have to kind of examine all those things yeah you know so so we get we get a lot of that and i think it's really important again examine why what are your motivations they have to be internal motivations yeah yeah definitely and another question that um i got was um someone said that is it possible for someone who is celibate to also have a low sex drive yeah i mean <laughs> you I, I shy, there are a lot of terms I shy away from, and one of them is even just like the low and the high sex drive, mm -hmm. because they can be weaponized, and you can now start to think, oh, I have a low sex drive, I have a problem, mm -hmm. I have a high sex drive, oh, my sex drive is too high, or it's, I don't have a low sex drive, so I don't have a problem. Um, I'd rather, you know, Emily Nagoski and a lot of um, sex researchers have talked about, you know, the responsive and the spontaneous desire. So as opposed to having a low and high libido, someone who would typically be said to have a high libido has more of a spontaneous um, desire where they don't necessarily need physical stimulus for them. It start, so sex for them starts in their brain mm -hmm. and then the physical um, aspect comes afterwards. Meanwhile, for someone with a responsive desire, sex starts with physical stimulus. They usually will not think about, they won't just be sitting down and think about having sex, but when they are starting to get physically stimulated, the desire for sex then starts to come. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can have a responsive desire even if you're celibate because you're understanding that, oh, maybe the person, um, doesn't really get sexual urges just out of the blue. And yeah. then they start to think that maybe there's a problem with them. There's no, you don't have a problem. You just need to understand um, what your sexual accelerators are and what your sexual breaks are. Yeah. And understanding that how do you improve your desire and your sexual response is by increasing the things that will accelerate your sexual drive. That is, that is fantastic. And it I just brings me that. Sorry, say that again. You did. I said, I did come up with that. Oh, I mean, of you did. Oh. <laughs> And there's this thing that we have in our society, and I don't know so much if it's our current generation or the generation that came before us in feeling as though, in women feeling as though sex with their male partners is a chore and doing it out of, well, yeah, it's my responsibility. You know how men are. What do you mm. say for that? Hey, so it's not today. Mm. It's not today. Like our grandmothers, our foremothers have been at this for a while. Um, you know, it's that whole idea. It doesn't, and I don't think it's just sex, you know. You ask a lot of women, why do they like cooking? And they'll tell you, ah, I have to feed my family. I'm nourishing my family. You know, I take care of, I think that comes from that whole nourishing 
Yeah. The women are the ones who take care of the family. And so part of their job is to have sex with their men so that one, their man does not go out to other women. Because of course, coming from a polygamous um, background um, in our culture, um, you know, there's that idea of if you don't, if you don't have enough sex with him, you just going to go and find another wife, mm. you know? So there's that. And now, okay, maybe people are not necessarily having multiple wives, but people are having one wife have multiple, multiple side chicks. Yeah, so right. it's that idea of, look, I want to do everything I can, which is why, I mean, we're seeing a high rise in a lot of um, plastic surgery for women in Nigeria. We're seeing a very high rise for women who are trying, you know, all kinds of sexual aids, um, drinking all sorts of things, going for all sorts of procedures, everything to just... And look, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have surgery. I'm not saying that you shouldn't drink what you want to drink. I'm not saying you shouldn't take pill, whatever it is you want to take. But again, I always say that it has to be self-motivating. Mm -hmm. Look, if I want to have Kim Kardashian's body after I finish having my children, because it makes me yesterday feel fantastic, that's my business. But if I want to have, you know, go and have a BBL because I don't want my husband to start looking outside or maybe because I noticed that my, my husband is looking at all the girls with like tiny waist, flat stomachs and big booties. And now I want to do that so that I can compete with them. <laughs> I'm on a long thing. I'm sleeping on a bicycle because if the man, any man that's going to go out and cheat on you, he's going to go out and cheat on you regardless. I mean, we see it all the time, you know, hot, fine women, women that are on point, you know, they're doing everything. It's not about you. Somebody cheating on you is actually not about you, it's about them. Mm. So again, that idea of, I want to have great sex. So the women that come to me, I'm starting to see a bit of more women that are coming and saying, look, I want to learn about pleasure for myself, mm. but most, and if I say like 75%, no, 85% of the women who come to me are coming to me because they want to have, they want to learn how to have better sex so that they can satisfy their husbands or their partners better. Because their husband or their partner has complained that, uh, you know, you know, it doesn't seem like you're really into it, or you don't know how to do this. Or, oh, how can I learn how to give him a better blowjob? How can mm -hmm. I learn to give, blow his mind? Oh, he wants to do doggy, but I don't really know how. How should I do it? How can I be on top? You know, he tells me to be on top. As opposed to look, I heard that women that are on top have better sex or they enjoy sex more how can i learn that so i can have better sex yeah. this is the difference in that motivation so for me it's that idea of do it sex is selfish and selfless at the same time they are mm -hmm. two sides of the same coin and you have to be able to balance the two if you're if you're too selfish it's a problem and if you're too selfless it's a problem you have to be able to get pleasure for yourself while you're giving pleasure to another yeah so yeah balance the two that is fantastic and just wrapping up on that note what about women who have become accustomed to feeling that sex is going to be painful because there are a lot of women who have only always had painful sex and they've never actually explored why exactly that you know it is painful what would you say to women who are in that situation i i'm really sorry first of all that you're experiencing that but the thing is that you're not alone a lot of women deal with painful sex, either because of a medical condition, you know, things like conditions like PCOS and endometriosis can lead for you to have painful sex. Vaginismus is another reason, a very common reason why a lot of women have painful sex. So you have to determine what is causing your painful sex. Understand that it's not normal. Like it's not okay for you to just be having sex and it's painful mm -hmm. and you're not doing anything about it and because a lot of times you find out that's why these women don't want to have sex they're not telling him that oh it's painful they're just like <laughs> you know and they're avoiding it let's find out why you know first rule out all the medical conditions if it's not a medical condition then we know that okay could it be a question of learning to relax are you getting enough sex play that is foreplay before you have sex because men will typically try to rush through everything to get to penetration. But we know that the typical woman needs about 15 to 45 minutes of play to get her vagina aroused. And when we mean aroused, we mean getting enough blood flow to all the parts of your vulva such that sex can be pleasurable to you. Because when you have that blood flow and you're aroused, your vagina actually gets softer. It becomes more like a pillow. That's when the men say, oh, sex is sweet. You know, what is sweet in there, it's, it's warm, it is soft. You know, they always talk about tight pussy. No, we don't want a tight pussy. We want a 
an elastic vagina, right? And if it's tight, you're not roused enough. Yeah. So learning to, to get to the point where your vagina has actually, you know, when you're aroused, your vagina actually gets wider. It gets bigger. So it can accommodate the penis. So the body, I mean, God is so good. He has designed our bodies perfectly to be able to experience things, but you can't jump the gun. If the woman is not aroused mm. and then you try to penetrate, it's going to hurt even if you have no medical condition. So there's nothing wrong with you per se. You're just, there's something wrong in the approach. So let's flip it over, play a lot more, take penetration of the table for a while and just play, you know, your hands, your mouth, find your erogenous zones, find all the things that you can find. And of course, if after all this, you are aroused, you have gotten lubrication because lubricant, adding lubricant doesn't mean you have a problem. It's just an extra help, you know? It's like, why do you use a spoon instead of using your hands to eat? You know, why are you ashamed? Why aren't you ashamed when you use a spoon to eat? Mm. Because it's a tool. So don't be ashamed to use if, to use lubricant. Think of it as a spoon to, you used to eat. So now you've used lubricant, you've had a lot of sex pain, but it's still painful. Now we know that, okay, there's definitely an issue. So then we now start to look at, maybe it's the angle of penetration. Maybe, you know, you're having sex from a wave, the man is on top or the man is behind. So the angle of penetration is getting too deep and it's hitting your cervix. So maybe you need to try to be on top because when you're on top, you can control the level of penetration and you can control the angle such that it's more pleasurable for him. He's, you, he's getting pleasure, but it's more pleasurable for you because he's not penetrating you as deeply and you can control not just the angle and not just how much penetration but also the intensity and the frequency of the penetration yeah. so there are a lot of ways to which is why it's always great to go speak to a sex coach you know see a doctor first make sure that you don't have any health issues but then see a sex coach so you can we can walk through all these together and give you practical ways for you to improve your um and reduce your pain that is fantastic yeah. yeah and what would you put in a um, in a toolkit for a virgin bride for her wedding night? Wow. <laughs> uh, that, that, that is quite interesting. Um, lube, lube, two different types of lube. I'm gonna put water-based lube and silicone lube because um, water-based lube is like the one that comes out of your body. It dries faster. Silicone-based lube, you need a little of it goes a long way, but you can you know, mix the two up. I would also, put maybe like some feathers for, you know, just that tickly play and just some things. I would put um, sex dice. Sex dice, um, they're these dye that um, have different positions so they can kind of, um, you know, have some fun. You know, you throw the dice and whatever position it lands on, you guys can try that. Obviously, um, what else would I put? I would say music, but I guess you can't really, you wouldn't necessarily put that in a sex kit, but just, you know, some music, some, just things that would just get you like set the mood. So candles, uh, things that aromatherapy because it kind of, you know, relaxes you and puts you in a good mood. And maybe a note that tells you to slow down and that penetration doesn't have to happen tonight. Mm -hmm. It can happen after a few tries. Yeah. It may not necessarily, you know, like learn, just play, have fun, um, you know, do everything, try to do everything but penetration. If penetration happens, it's fine. And if it, at first you don't succeed keep trying yeah yeah definitely i love that thank you so much and what on a rounding up note what would you say to women who want to explore their sexual pleasure now what would be if you were to sort of give them a roadmap where would you tell them to start uh i would tell them to start with themselves yeah. um introspection self-introspection um what are the things that give you pleasure outside of sex? So, so it could be that you just like to sit down by the beach and watch the waves. And that just makes you at peace and happy. You know, like, first of all, indulge in the non-sexual pleasures. And by doing that, you will be able to tap better into your sexual pleasures. And of course, then, you know, discovering your body, like discovering your body outside of a partner and then sharing those discoveries with your partner yeah. so but i think it's important for you to first of all sh discover that i mean for some people um they, they find it hard to do things by themselves i know people who cannot take themselves out to a movie who cannot take themselves out to lunch you know they have to go to lunch with somebody mm. uh, learn to i think that if you learn to spend more time with yourself it will only enhance 
your time with somebody else. Yeah. So I, I would really say that, you know, just your roadmap to pleasure is first of all, experience pleasure for yourself, mm-hmm. for yourself, by yourself, and then take that experience and channel it into your time with your partner. Yeah, that is fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Izzy. This has been absolutely amazing.